Today I want us to wrap up the series, Change My Heart. We've been going through uh, looking at this great biblical character of Jacob over the last, I think, nine weeks. And uh, Jacob dies today, guys. I got some bad news for you. <laughs> but um, not before he teaches us some powerful lessons. And I want to uh, share with you today um, some things about the powerful grace of God. You know, we live in a world that is without grace, and uh, we live in a dog-eat-dog world. You punch me, I punch you back harder. You kind of get what you deserve. That's kind of the universe that we live in. And yet God's economy and God's perspective is so much different. God is a God of grace. God looks at the world differently. Uh, God wants us, as we walk with him, to see the world differently. Uh, And in Genesis chapter 48... We see a beautiful, powerful example of how we can truly live by grace. Um, God offers us the opposite of what we generally think we deserve. We deserve, uh, and yet God gives us forgiveness. Uh, We deserve wrath. Uh, God offers us love. Um, But we tend to think backwards. And I've titled the message today, You Got It Backwards, because many times we think, kind of according to the world that you kind of get what you deserve, but God sees the world through the eyes of grace. God sees the world in a totally different way. And grace is not just a theology or or a box to check off. Grace is a lens by which God wants us to look at our own circumstances, our own lives, and those around us in a completely different way. And I really believe that it would change the world if we began to see the world through the eyes of grace. Today in our text, we find three generations of individuals. In fact, I think the theme of Genesis 48 is passing on the grace of God. You have Jacob, whose name is also Israel, because he got his name changed. Jacob is granddad. You got Joseph, that's the son. And you got Ephraim and Manasseh, that are the grandkids. And we're going to see how grace is passed on to each of these generations. But let's look first at Jacob. We've been talking so much about Jacob over the last few weeks. And uh, Genesis 48, verse 3, Jacob is at the end of his life. He's about to take his last breath. He is gathered with his son Joseph, the favored son, and with his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And this is kind of the final dialogue that Jacob... Jacob has before he dies. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous and I will make many nations come from you. And I will give this land as a permanent possession to your future descendants. Um, First of all, grace transcends your failures. Now, the, the reason that Jacob mentions this place called Luz is that that's the place where he met God. And if you go back to the pages of Scripture, you you see that Jacob has a vision of a stairway that goes to heaven. This is the moment that his life was changed. And every person of faith has a moment. You may not remember the exact date and time, but there's a time, there is a time where you came by faith and put your trust in the Lord. Maybe you were at a church service. Maybe you were at a conference. Maybe a friend shared with you over a cup of coffee. Maybe you were reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit just spoke to you. But somehow, someway, there was a moment where the seed of faith took root in your life and things began to change. Before this time, Jacob was a very self-manipulative a selfish, manipulative individual. He was a guy that was all about me, 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 me. But God begins to change his heart. And if you look back in the early pages of his life, he steals the birthright and the blessing, which is the inheritance of his big brother. Remember, Jacob's the little brother. He's the second of the twins. And he rips Esau off. Esau says, I'm going to kill you. He runs off, goes and lives with Uncle Laban for 20 years. And Jacob's all about himself. In fact, when he gets to Laban, he's tricking his father-in-law. And his father-in-law is tricking him. And they're trying to out-manipulate each other. And 
Really, Jacob's whole life before he really met God was all about his own self-interest. But he's recalling this spiritual journey that he's been on, and he reminds us that grace transcends your failures. The grace of God is greater than your own mistakes. See, we tend to think that God blesses people that are smart, that are qualified, that are strong, that are connected, that are good. No, 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 no. The grace of God doesn't work that way at all. The grace of God works through a totally different way. And God gave Jacob 12 sons, and he promised to make great nations from them. Um, Jacob didn't deserve it. Jacob now is the the, the, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, this is such a huge monumental honor in Scripture to be known as the father of the 12 tribes. I mean, are you kidding me? Abraham was the father of faith. He had a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob has the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a big deal. But God used a broken, self-interested individual by the name of Jacob to be the father of the nations of Israel. It's amazing. How is that possible? Because God is always in the business of changing hearts and lives. See, the more that you get to know God, the more that God wants to change your heart and your life. And how you start is not always how you finish. And Jacob is recalling this. He's saying, man, God appeared to me at love, changed my life, blessed me, gave me a promise. I didn't deserve it. There were other people that were more qualified. There were people that were more kind and more loving. But for some reason, God picked me and grace transcends my failures. Now, God is patient with us. I mean, he, he re- references this encounter with God and at this place called Luz. He also renamed it Bethel. Uh, because of the encounter he had with God, meaning house of God. And in biblical times, people would rename places based on spiritual experiences that they had. So uh, I like Bethel better than Luz, because I think Luz doesn't really sound like that great of a place. Bethel sounds a little bit better, amen? Doesn't it? But Jacob is 70 years old, for crying out loud. I mean, you know, we could call him a late bloomer. He didn't meet the Lord till he was 70. I mean, he is a senior adult, Amen? Sometimes it takes us a while. Sometimes some of us are on the slow journey with the Lord. You know, it takes us a while to get there. And that's all right. God is patient, though. God's patient. God's patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He's he's patient with us. And I think God had been sending a message to Jacob a long time. Jacob probably was just not listening. But finally, it resonates with him. Well, you know, it's interesting. In the Hebrews chapter 11, if you flip to the New Testament... In Hebrews chapter 11, we have the roll call of faith, and it lists off all of the great heroes of the Old Testament, and it tells all the climactic things that they did. So like it says, Noah was awesome because he built an ark, and he did it by faith, and Abraham left the place where he lived to go to a a land of promise. He didn't even know where he was going. He just started walking, and then, you know, it goes on and talks about Rahab, how she hid the spies at the city of Jericho, and it's all these great like you know like movie clip moments in the old testament but when it gets to jacob this is what it says in hebrews 11 21 by faith jacob when he was dying blessed each of his sons the sons of joseph and he worshiped leaning on top of a staff i mean i don't know about you that doesn't sound very exciting this doesn't sound very dynamic very interesting right like jacob got old He leaned on his staff, he sang a Hillsong worship song, and he blessed his grandkids, and then boom, that was it. Why wouldn't the writer of Hebrews talk about about the uh, wrestling match that he had with the angel of the Lord? That was a lot more interesting. You know, can you imagine Jacob, he jumped off the turnbuckle and put the angel of the Lord in a headlock, and then the full Nelson, and I mean, that would have been much better in Hebrews chapter 11, but... The summary of his life, and Jacob only gets, I believe, one verse here, one or two verses in Hebrews 11, but the summary of his life is that he passed on grace to his son and to his grandsons. That's what's being communicated here. 
They couldn't say a lot of great things about Jacob earlier in his life because he was so self-interested. But you know what? He did get it at the end. And the climactic moment of Jacob's life was not when he was you know, becoming wealthy, uh, working with the livestock of his uncle. It wasn't wrestling with the angel of the Lord. It wasn't even the, 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 the encounter at Bethel when he saw the stairway to heaven. It was something different. It was when he passed on the grace that he had experienced to his grandkids and to his son Joseph. And so this is the commentary in Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21. It, it's kind of weird if you're reading Hebrews chapter 11. It kind of sticks out as kind of like a downer. But really there's something that's really powerful there. And it reminds us that all of us need Jesus the same way. Jacob got to the end of his life and he wanted to do two things. He wanted to bless others and he wanted to worship God. Is there anything more beautiful than that? If we could pass that on to our kids and to our grandkids, worship God and bless them in doing so, wow, that's beautiful. Now see, seeing the world through grace um, helps us to become grateful, grateful, uh, satisfied, uh, and always expecting, uh, instead of always expecting more, hopeful, um, not giving up, not quitting, faithful, full of faith and confidence in the Lord. Uh, and, and Jacob talks a little bit more about this in verse 15 of Genesis 48. He refers to God as a shepherd. Now I think this is the first occurrence in the Old Testament where God is called a shepherd. But Jacob was a shepherd. That was his livelihood. That was his profession. And, and so he began to see God as a shepherd. He compared what he did in his daily routine of life to the role that God has with his people. Now, I don't know a lot about sheep, but a few years ago, I got the crazy idea to preach through the 23rd Psalm, and I told our team, I said, I need a live sheep on the stage here at Edge Church. And so we found a willing sheep that was willing to come up and, and, and be my little example, and we brought him up on the stage, and we had a church member that was from Kansas, and so I had him be like the shepherd for the day. And they showed up early and took the sheep outside and like tended to the sheep and took care of the sheep. And I, I'm a city guy, right? I, I, I don't know anything about livestock, about animals. But I learned some things that day. And here's what I learned. Number one, sheep are ornery. Sheep don't do what they're told. They got a mind of their own. Sheep wander. I mean, if we didn't have the shepherd out with the sheep, he would have ended up at the Methodist church. Amen. That's just the way sheep are. Sheep also will bite you. They don't like something. They'll nibble. Now, we think sheep are like beautiful and, and, and you know, these, these amazing animals that they're just so tame. And they're wild animals, though. They're wild. They may be beautiful in some ways, but they're, they're, a, they're a piece of work. And so when, when Jacob calls God a shepherd he's also calling himself a sheep and he recognizes that people like sheep need to be led people need to be disciplined people need to be helped people need to be uh, corrected uh, I was amazed at how fearful that that sheep was that sheep maybe it was just being in the house of God I don't know what it was but but it was literally shaking you know I felt bad even bringing the Maybe he had some kind of stage fright, you know, but he came up on the stage and, and uh, we, we kept him outside hoping that he would do his business outside, but, you know, sheep are wild animals. He didn't decide to, to, to relieve himself until he came into the building, and uh, we had some problems with that. I won't get into the details, but sheep are wild. Sheep are the only animals that have a whole profession that is designated to their care. A shepherd, because they need a lot of love, and they need a lot of help, and they need a lot of correction. And Jacob called God a shepherd. Now, it's interesting that he said that, because he said that the shepherd was leading him all the days of his life, but Jacob went through some really hard times. He had to work 14 years for the woman that he loved, uh, his, Rachel, the heartthrob, the love of his life died relatively early in their marriage while she was giving birth to their second kid. 
he was constantly in a battle with his father-in-law that he lived with, um, who was always trying to rip him off. He uh, had a lot of other hardships. He had to run for his life because his brother wanted to kill him. And yet, you know what? Because Jacob saw his life through the lens of grace, he saw God as a good shepherd that was still guiding him. You know, when you see the world through the grace of God, you will see the hardship that you've been through, but you won't become cynical and negative. You will see that as part of God's divine story of him bringing you through the things that you've gone through. You'll say, man, God led me through that. God comforted me. God aided me. God supported me. God helped me. And Jacob knows that he made some bad choices and did some dumb things, but man, God was with him all the while, all the way. So are we motivated by grace? What are your spiritual motives? Jacob was motivated by grace, and grace transcends our failures. Isn't it great to know that even though we make mistakes and even though we mess up, that the grace of God can still operate in our lives? And this is what we learned from Jacob. But Jacob was not the only one in this story that experienced the grace of God. Joseph did too. Joseph was the favored son of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. He loved Joseph the most. Now the family was a little dysfunctional because he played favorites. But usually the first son, which would have been Reuben, would be the favored son. In this particular story, it was Joseph. So now Jacob is dying and he's with his favorite son, Joseph. And this is what he says in verse 11. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has even allowed me to see your offspring. What's going on with that? Well, Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons. By the way, if you're on the basketball team and you're the 11th man, you don't get a lot of court time. So there's nothing... There's nothing spectacular about the birth order of Joseph. He's the 11th of 12, okay? He's not not the youngest brother, but he's like the next to youngest. Okay, so he's the 11th son. But he's the favored son, and one day Jacob gives him this beautiful coat. And the Bible calls it a coat of many colors. I think it was probably tie-dyed. What do you think? It was beautiful. And the brothers were jealous. They were jealous because... Well, what about our coat? Well, give us a present. Come on, Dad. And so they get really envious, and they're like, we're going to kill him. We're going to kill our brother. So they grab him. They throw him in a cistern that doesn't have water. They later decide to not take his life, but they sell him as a slave. Then they take that coat. They dip it in animal blood, and they tell the dad, Jacob, your favorite son is dead. And Jacob is devastated. I mean, he is absolutely heartbroken. It's with all that in mind that he says in verse 11, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has even let me see your offspring. In other words, Jacob didn't think that he would ever see Joseph again. Joseph, he was told, died. But he says, I got blessed twice. I saw you, but then I also saw my grandkids. I'm even more blessed. And Jacob says, that was all by the grace of God. Because see, grace revives dead things. Grace revives the things that we don't think exist anymore. Did you know that the grace of God is the thing that revives dead relationships? It's the thing that revives dead dreams. It's the grace of God that revives things that we think could never exist or could never happen again. God is in the business of raising dead things to new life. In John chapter 11, it was Lazarus that was raised from the dead, and Mary and Martha got their brother back. All throughout Scripture, we see that it is the grace of God that redeems things that we believe are no longer there. Now, Joseph was sold into slavery at the age of 17. He was falsely accused of rape at the age of 28. He was imprisoned. And then at the age of 30, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. Whoa. I mean, you want to talk about a story. At the age of 17, he's at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. 
A man named Potiphar buys him. He joins the household of Potiphar. He becomes the head servant. Evidently, Potiphar was pretty wealthy. Things are going great for Joseph. He's got a great income. He's got a lot of you know, respect. He's got a lot of influence. He's working his way up. Potiphar loves him. But Joseph was a really good-looking dude. And the wife of Potiphar hid on him every day, the scripture tells us. And finally, when Joseph would not have relations with her, she lied about him. She falsely accused him. And Joseph was put in prison and he was there for a few years. But you know what? Joseph began to rise even in the pit, even in the, even in the prison, man. Joseph began to rise up. God began to give him favor in prison. He had favor with the inmates, a baker. And a butler had a dream, and Joseph interpreted those, and people began to turn to Joseph. Joseph became the spiritual leader of the prison. He didn't deserve to be there, but he was there. And a few years later, he gets out, and he rises, and he becomes the prime minister. Man, the number two guy in Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world. Joseph realized, I don't deserve to be here, but it was all by the grace of God. If you've got some things you don't deserve, you know what I'm talking about. That's called grace. Grace is the thing that elevates us beyond what we deserve. Grace is the thing that keeps us going when we don't feel like we can go another step. And Jacob is celebrating the fact that what he thought was lost has now come back to him. Wow. What's the thing in your life that you've given up on? What have you said? The story's over or it's way too hard or I'm tired of struggling, or this is never going to happen, I'm never going to get the victory, I'm never going to know what to do, I'm never going to get out of this situation. Wow. Remember the grace of God. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. Grace gives us favor. Grace gives us opportunity. Joseph didn't deserve to be in that high-ranking position, but he was. Grace. Grace empowers us in our personal relationships. I I think perhaps the greatest moment of Joseph's life was not becoming prime minister. It was probably forgiving the brothers who had treated him so poorly. If you push the fast forward button, Joseph is, is over the distribution of food and grain in Egypt during a time of world famine. Um, the, the brothers of Joseph have left Canaan to go to Egypt because that's the only place there's any food. And when they get there, they have to go before their brother to ask for food to save their lives. The, the deal is, though, they don't realize that it's actually Joseph. It's been too many years. They don't recognize him. And through a very interesting uh, set of circumstances, Joseph is reconciled with his brothers. He forgives them for what they did. And when he gives the commentary on this circumstance, he, he says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you planned evil against me, but God planned it for the good uh, about the present results, the survival of many people. In other words, he saw the world through grace. Joseph said, listen, you guys intended to harm me But God used this to bring about the good. Do you believe that today? That God can take the broken things in your life. God can take the things that you think are the most hurtful and the most difficult. And he can still bring about good. Even though those things have hurt us so deeply and so so much. Wow. It was grace. There was one huge setback. And then another setback. And then another setback. But... But God and his grace continued to sustain Joseph, and Joseph stayed faithful to God. And and in the meantime, God worked and did things that only God could do. Grace is the way we treat other people. Just think about how the world would be. Think about how your family would be if there was a little bit more grace. The brothers of Joseph don't even believe that he's really sincere about not punishing them. Because after Jacob dies at the end of chapter 48... They go back to, to, to their brother, Joseph, and they're like, okay, now you're going to kill us, right? Okay, you were like, nice, because you wanted to see your father again, but we brought Jacob to see you. Now you're going to really let us have it. Joseph's like, no, grace. 
Grace. Grace emboldens us and empowers us to forgive those that have oppressed us. And it's a beautiful picture of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and yet God forgave us in Christ. Grace revives dead things. Grace also rewrites our future. See, the final thing that Jacob wants to do is he wants to bless Ephraim and Manasseh, the grandkids. This is a beautiful picture of a granddad spending his final moments of his life loving his grandkids. Ephraim and Manasseh are probably in their 20s. They're not little bitty kids. They're, they're young men at this time. And they're spending these, these, these last remaining minutes with, with Jacob. And the Bible says that he took both of them in his hands, beginning in verse 10. With his right hand, Ephraim, towards Israel's left. And with his left hand, Manasseh, towards Israel's right. And he brought them to Israel. But Israel stretched out his right hand and put it on the head of Ephraim, the younger. And crossing his hands, put his left on Manasseh's head. Although Manasseh was the firstborn. And then he blessed Joseph. And he said, now what's going on here? Well, typically the right hand is the hand of power. You bless the oldest with the right hand. So Joseph thinks, I got this. And he brings in the boys and he puts big brother Manasseh in front of Jacob's right hand. Because he's thinking, I'm going to get the right hand blessing. The big blessing is going to big brother. Right hand, Manasseh, big brother. Left hand, little brother. And Jacob's kind of senile. He's kind of old and he's, like I said, he's about to die. And Joseph's going to correct him, but, but Jacob switches the hands. And he puts the right hand, the hand of power, the hand of blessing on the head of the younger. And he puts the lesser hand on the older and he reverses it. Now why would he do that? Well, uh, Jacob was the younger brother. Remember, he got the blessing and the birthright, but really Esau deserved it. And throughout scripture... In the book of Genesis, primarily, we see that the, sometimes God picks the younger. God picked Abel over Cain. God picked Isaac over Ishmael. God picks uh, uh, Ephraim over Manasseh. There's a few other examples. I believe the reason that God did this was to remind us that God's ways are not always predictable. God's ways are not always put in a box and predetermined and, and delivered. Sometimes God does things that are unorthodox. The first Corinthians says that, that um, God does uh, unusual things. I mean, he confounds the wise. God comes up with his own schemes. God has his own ideas about things. Sometimes God just picks different people by his own sovereign decree. Sometimes God just simply decides, I'm going to go this direction. And it's a great reminder that we got to follow the Lord, not a formula. But look at the remaining part of the passage there. The God uh, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all, all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys. And may they, call, may they be, be called by my name. In the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow to be numerous within the land. And when Joseph saw that his father had placed the right hand on Ephraim's head, he thought it was a mistake. And he took his father's hand and he moved it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh. So Joseph still didn't get it. He still didn't see what was going on. But I love this blessing, this prayer here. Um, it's a grace-filled prayer. He wants Manasseh and Ephraim, the grandkids... To know the grace of God. And he says, remember the faith of Abraham and Isaac, the great granddads. Jacob's father and grandfather. And so he, he talks about his faith. He talks about his encounter with God at Luz. He talks about the fact that he wrestled with an angel. He gives his testimony. He's like, boys, remember the rich things that God did in my life. Learn from me. Learn from me because grace rewrites your future. Jacob is, is redirecting the future of this family. He's bringing Ephraim and Manasseh into his lineage. He's, he's actually adopting them into his family. 
Now, there's 12 tribes of Israel and there's 12 sons of Jacob. But what's interesting is in the 12 tribes of, of Jacob, we have Ephraim and we have Manasseh. But they're the grandkids. So to, how did the grandkids get their own tribes? How did that happen? Because Joseph was the favored son. Joseph becomes the first. Remember, he was the 11th. He became the first son. Reuben, the actual first son of of Jacob, um, slept with one of his father's wives. And so as you read the remaining pages of Scripture, Reuben's kind of, you know, he's kind of put in a different category because of some choices that he made. Joseph becomes the first, but there's not a tribe of Joseph. If you look at all the tribes of Israel, you never see tribe of Joseph. But what you do see is the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph is doubly blessed by bringing his sons into the 12 tribes. Do you see it? This is grace. Ephraim and Manasseh didn't deserve to be treated like a son. They were grandkids. But Jacob and God in his grace brought them in and they received their own, uh, their own tribes of Israel. So this, is, this redirects the direction of the family. And when you have the grace of God in your life, it will rewrite the future of your family. You know, a few years ago, we planted Edge Church. We started our church. We started in our living room. We were meeting at the school. We had a family that showed up at church one Sunday. And the husband said, Pastor Ryan, this is crazy. I became a Christian last night watching a Christian movie. And he told me the title of it. And he said, I committed my life to Christ and I don't even know what I did. But I just felt like I needed to come to church. So he shows up. He's been addicted to drugs. Uh, His marriage is a mess. Uh, All kinds of problems, difficulties. And this stuff had been going on for, you know, other generations. It it had been passed down. You know, the Bible says the sins of the fathers get get passed on for many generations. And this was that example. You know, promiscuity and adultery and drugs and just whatever you can think of it's it's all going on and he shows up at church with his wife and the grace of God showed up and they were able to put their marriage back together and they were able to get help and some healing and man the Lord began to work so powerfully and wonderfully and he did a a video testimony that we showed to our church where he tells this whole story a few years ago but um, they also moved to another state so I haven't seen them in a few years but I do know that they go to church regularly And that what they're passing on to their children is totally different from the upbringing that they had. They they didn't have the Lord. They didn't have God. They didn't have church. They didn't know about God's grace. But they've made it their mission to teach their kids what they didn't know. And it's rewritten the whole history of their family. Is there anything more beautiful than that? Anything more wonderful than that? Some of you are first generation Christians. Maybe you came from families where, you know, maybe you didn't really go to church, you didn't know the Lord, but you have an opportunity to pass on a legacy of faith to your kids and even your grandkids. See, we we talk about our kids a lot, but listen, a real legacy goes on for multiple generations. How amazing would it be that the choices that you made in your life today were impacting? For the good, your kids and your grandkids and your kids' kids and even further generations. You had the opportunity to rewrite the family tree of your life to be a legacy of faith. And Jacob's dying breath is that those grandkids, Ephraim and Manasseh, would know God the way that he knew him and the way that Joseph knew him and the way that their descendants would know would know him. Isn't that beautiful? I love that so much. There's a couple of other examples if you look uh, in the story of Jacob. um, There's a couple of the other boys that I wanted to mention. Two of the older brothers uh, of of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, and Simeon and Levi um, had violent tempers. Their sister Dinah was raped and they took revenge by slaughtering a whole city. You, You can read about this in Genesis 34. Uh, Jacob was obviously very upset about that, and that was not God's plan, but these guys didn't have a lot of self-control, and that's what they did. Um, If you 
continue to read on, the tribe of Simeon, the descendants of Simeon, becomes a tribe that's basically irrelevant. It's the smallest and weakest of Israel. They don't even really get their own land. When you get to the book of Joshua, um, they, get, like, they get a piece of land, but it's kind of rolled in with the tribe of Judah. Um, they're weak. They're insignificant. You really don't hear from them ever again. And that's because they didn't really change the direction of their life. They kind of followed, I think, in the path of Simeon, the father of the tribe. But Simeon's brother Levi was also there murdering those people with Simeon. But what's beautiful is when you get to the book of Exodus, many generations later, Moses comes down from the mountain. He's been worshiping God. The people have made a golden calf. And Moses is upset. He said, who's going to stand on the side of God? It was the Levites that stood with Moses. And so God made them the worship leaders and the priests of Israel. It's beautiful. All the worship leaders, the pastors, the priests, whatever you're going to call them, all from the tribe of Levi. What does all that mean? Uh, That means that the moral of the story is that some people do what all their relatives do and other people make changes. The Levites said, you know what? We're not going to live under this cloud. We're not going to live in the history of our father Levi. We're going to make a change. We're going to serve God. Whereas the people of Simeon, the guys of Simeon were kind of like, well, I think we'll just kind of stay lukewarm and half-hearted and see where it goes. We can make a change. Grace can rewrite your future. And that's what God wants to do. Now, how can we do this? Jacob takes these boys and he blesses them by physical touch. Okay, physical touch. He kissed and embraced them. Boys get masculinity from their fathers and grandfathers. Boys need physical touch. Sometimes we don't touch boys as much when they get, you know, to be preteens and teenagers, but we always need that. We need to hug our boys, love our boys. Quality time, in verse 9, Jacob's spending time with these boys, passing it on, interacting with them. And finally, words of affirmation, verses 15 and 16, he tells them the story of his God. And if we can pass on physical touch, quality time, and words of affirmation, we can baptize our families in the grace of God. Listen, it's not just about how you started It's about how you finish. Let's pass on to future generations incredible opportunity of grace. And let's be the conduits through which God works and moves. Would you pray with me?